Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. Everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Tom. How you doing? Good, good, good. Jim Bernash, how are you? John Bona, is your camera on? Or could you turn your camera on? I'm sorry, I was on mute. This is Jim Barnash. I'm fine, thanks. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Where Where do you live? Where's home, Jim? Vernon Hills, Illinois, about 40 miles north of Chicago. Ah, there you go. So it's cold up there. Yeah, and it's going to get colder next week. Oh, gosh. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Me too. We're, we're supposed to get to um, five degrees, between one and five in Nashville. I mean, they close schools. And it's because of um, the temperature. I mean, it's amazing. I lived in Petoskey for 17 years. And to be coming down here when they would close schools because of temperature, I'm thinking, what the heck? You know, we had 15 below zero for two weeks. That's what's that? Well, the kids here don't have coats, so they kind of have to make amends for the average person who attends our public school. So welcome. So you're you're still in Illinois and you are not a Wisconsin. I'm in Illinois. Correct. All right. But you must be real close to the border. Very close. Uh, it's actually closer for me to get to uh, 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 Milwaukee than it is to Chicago time-wise. Sure, sure, sure. That's a pretty part of the country, too. Very nice. Pretty kind. John Bono, you registered twice, sir. Are you twice as excited to be here? I never received the confirmation for the first registration. Not a problem. I'm just glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. It's gonna be. It's going to be fun. Jim Cummings and Felicia, can you fight? There you are, Melissa, again. Gosh, I can't get rid of you. It's like the flu. Jeez. All right. Um, we've got almost 50 that are registered. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on this. Um, but before I do, let me kind of just share with you what, what you have signed up for on this uh, weekly wisdom sample of what we're going to do every week. So I'm putting together a, um, a weekly wisdom, a conversation starter. Okay, Felicia, perfect. Be safe. A weekly wisdom, because what I have found in 50 years of doing this is most people, it's not an issue of I don't see enough people. The average person sees over 100 people a week. Unfortunately, they have nothing to say to about 98 of them. And then they stumble of the two they're trying to make an appointment with. So what I want to do through these weekly wisdoms is that I have found through my life that the older I get, the easier this is to sell life insurance. And it's easier to sell life insurance because of not only what I believe, but why I believe it. And then I share conversation starters where I can become a person of interest and someone wants to hear the rest of the story. For those of you who got the weekly wisdom for this week, it's about the day you decide to retire and the city and state you live in on your date of retirement will, will actually have more of an impact on the quality of your retirement than the underlying investment that you're in. Now, really, that's kind of a pretty bold statement, which is one of the reasons why I do not favor anything indexed. So whether it's indexed UL, indexed um, variable annuities, indexed life insurance, anything with an index. And we're going to go over an index as an example. And I use this when I teach in my breakaway league, how to understand how wealth actually works. Our industry has been allowed to use the words like average, not actual, average. And averages are not any indication of actual when I consider the distribution side of wealth accumulation. I was one of the few financial advisors when I did have my series 6, 63, 65, and 7 was I built a practice around helping people understand how they can spend what they've saved. What a concept. 
when you think about it, the only reason people actually save money is to eventually spend it. But most financial advisors who are fee-based, once they find out for every dollar that's in cash value, I can spend as if it were $4 in an IRA, they have no incentive to cut their income by putting $1 million in cash value and $4 million in an IRA. Now, as a fiduciary, you're required by law to put your client's best interest ahead of yours, which I find kind of comical because some of the best people that have attended the Breakaway League and gone through our program were equity guys. And when they look at how rate of return is irrelevant to how wealth works, I mean, their eyeballs fall out of their head, their jaw drops to the floor, and they're asking themselves, why didn't I know this before? Well, that's what I'm going to try and teach in Weekly Wisdom. I want to give back. I have been very fortunate in my life. I love this business, but I've I spent a vast majority of my business hiding behind the fact life insurance is so good. I was a money guy. I was chasing rates of returns. I wanted the same thing as the wholesalers, assets under management. That's the key. Well, when the market dropped 22% in 2022, because the market was bad, I had 3,000 pissed off clients. Well, I don't have any pissed off clients anymore. I've got about $3 billion of clients' money that isn't subject to political influence. I could care less who's in the Oval Office. It's not subject to the stock market volatility because none of this is related to stock market performance. Every dime of it is guaranteed to be worth more every single month, and not a penny of it is ever going to show up on a federal income tax return. Now, when I go over how wealth works with people, especially in our own industry, the light bulbs go off. And I'm telling you, I've never had more fun in my life teaching the average American taxpayer how wealth works. And when people actually realize how wealth works and they understand the implications of the financial choices they've made and also embrace the financial opportunities available to every single United States taxpaying citizen, most will come to this conclusion. I'm doing it wrong. Well, only when a problem is identified can a solution be offered. Now think about that. We offer solutions when we talk to people. We have no idea if, if they even know they have a problem. This is good stuff here. Sit down. I'm going to tell you some really, really good stuff here. You're going to be blown away by how intelligent I am and how wonderful this is. And you're sitting there going, I don't even acknowledge I have a problem. Why are you here? So the reason why I want to give back through these weekly wisdoms is I want you to pick out one. We've already got, I think we've shot 35 or 40 already. Go in, listen to them, pick out one that embraces you. Build a story around it so you can lead with passion, purpose, drive. Now, I'll tell you, when you do that, two things are going to happen. And this is great for all of us. Either you're going to find someone who believes what you believe, they become a client, and you got your arm around them, and you're both walking to financial freedom together. Or the person thinks you're a flaming idiot and walks away. Walks away. Either way, you win. When you think about it, the idea that I've identified in 20 seconds someone who would have normally wasted my life chasing, God, what a breath of fresh air. You mean I don't have to appease you or chase you or prove something to you? I don't do spreadsheets. I've done spreadsheets for my own good because I want to make sure the information I'm sharing is accurate. But I don't use spreadsheets. I don't show illustrations. I have no idea what the face amount's going to be. It's going to be huge. And you know why? Because that's what you're buying. And by the way, we're buying the smallest face amount allowed by law so that you could pile as much cash off the radar screen of the IRS for income tax purposes as you want to, as little or as much. And I'm telling you, people, I've never had more fun. Selling life insurance has never been easier. Getting people's jaws to drop. I didn't know it could do that. Why doesn't everybody do this? Hmm, good question. Why aren't we? I will tell you this, 20 to 25% of all the cash values in all of the life insurance companies from all of the industry are owned by the wealthiest 1% of this country. Bank of America has $25 billion in cash value. 
Now, remember, if you listen to the radio heads, life insurance is a horrible rate of return. You're right. It downright sucks. It sucks. But you know how good it is? You'd have to earn 20% a year in a mutual fund every year to spend the same way the tax code treats these distributions. And it's not about life insurance as a 20% rate of return. That's hogwash. It sucks. It buys bonds for God's sake. But the way the tax code treats the distribution as collateral, not as income. And, and, and my pet peeve in the industry is that we all seem to think it produces tax-free income. My God, you're taking a stick with a sharp object on the end and you're stabbing the eyeballs out of the internal revenue. It's not income. If it's income, it is required by law to be put on a tax return. This isn't income. It's cash flow. Cash flow is not taxable. Income is. So when we talk about these strategies within the Breakaway League, when we talk about how to use cash value as collateral, it literally is collateralized money. It's why Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Warren Buffett don't pay a lot of income tax. It's because they don't have a lot of income they got a heck of a lot of wealth and they use it as collateral. They hold their money right here close to their chest and they use it as collateral and go live on someone else's money. The fascinating part of everything we teach is that there's only one asset, only one that according to the internal revenue code, you cannot collateralize. Unfortunately, it's where you have the majority of your money. It's called a qualified retirement plan. I hate to break this to you, but 1974, when ERISA came out with qualified retirement plans, they hired an actuary with one purpose in mind, hurt the wealthy. Let the disadvantaged benefit, but disguise it under this guise of, well, you're going to be in a lower tax bracket. I found it fascinating when I was a registered rep. I was allowed to say that, yet forbidden to put it in writing. And the reason why you can't put it in writing, sign it and date it on your corporate stationery is because your E&O coverage will not pay the claim. You have no idea what the tax bracket is going to be on the day the client retires. You have no idea how successful or how much financial failure that client has actually received. So for you to say you're going to be in a lower tax bracket, my God, I hope it's never recorded because it can come back to haunt you. Last week, we had a milestone, $36 trillion in debt. Hmm. Who's going to pay for that? Anyone who files a tax return. The IRS knows us based on one function in our lifetime, a federal income tax return that we are required by law to file every year if we have income. What if we don't have income? What if we could position the portfolios so that the distributions are being used as collateral and produces cash flow that does not show up on a tax return. You qualify for food stamps, government cheese, free cell phones, Obamacare, and you're not filing a tax return. Now, is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? Probably not. And the reason is because if you've got 1099s and dividends and all of those other taxable events that are above a certain amount, you're gonna have to file tax returns. But isn't it a good day if you're going to have to pay income tax on $44,000 but spending two hundred? dollars Is that a good day still? That's what we talk about. And what I want to do in this, in this weekly wisdom course is I simply want you to be able to use one or two or three, and you're going to get them every week free of charge. And then every week, we're going to have an opportunity to do something like this. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, where I'm going to be able to be online with you answering questions on how do you use it? What kind of responses do you get? What do you hear good about it? What's bad about it? When would you apply it? What are you looking for? What is your objective? What is? Those are the things that I want to try to give back to the industry. Because as I said, our average premium is $77,000. And it's not PUAs. And, and, and the reason why it's so high isn't because we're such fascinating salespeople. It's because we create environments conducive where the, the client... The prospect is saying, how much can I put in? Well, according to the tax code, as much as you want. Now, the underwriters might have a different opinion because you can't be 30 years old making $2 million a year buying a $300 million death benefit. And I'm telling you, the younger you are, the more you want to put in, the higher that darn death benefit. Even if we're buying limited pay contracts, I cannot tell you how many times we've bounced off the ceiling trying to call underwriting, can you give us more death benefits? He wants to pay more. 
Now, when I first heard this strategy 20 years ago, I'm thinking, uh-uh, look, nobody likes life insurance. Life insurance rate of return stinks. It can't anywhere compete with what I do with my investments. And I just put it aside. And then I started to do the math. And I started to play with the numbers. And I started to look at the results. And then I looked at how it was impacting my tax return. And I have not found anything in 50 years that spends better than collateral. Because I'm not spending my money. And if I hold it to my chest, I get stepped up basis on whatever it's worth. And if I never spend it, I'm never taxed on it. Then I get to live free of any income tax. What I find fascinating about this is the strategy we employ, only 4% of the population buys their life insurance the way we show it. 4%. Now, if the roles were flipped and 96% of the people were buying their insurance the way we show it, man, the code would probably have to change. But I do want to remind you, the tax code as, as it stands has affected life insurance once, back in the 80s, back when Metropolitan took out a full-page ad in the Wall Street Journal and the title of the article, Cheat the Government. I mean, it literally was taking a stick with a sharp object into the den of the Internal Revenue's lion lair and stabbing eyeballs out. When you confront them like that, they will challenge you back. And they did. And they stopped the sale of single premium whole life. But let me remind you once again how that went down. Senators Rostankowski and um, there was a Democrat. And who was the Republican? Packwood stood on the steps of the of the Capitol saying, we have enough votes. Now, this was February. We have enough votes to change single premium whole life, and, and it's not going to be available. Effective July. February, we're going to change the code, but we're going to give all of our friends four months to buy all the single premium whole life they can. So all of our wealthy brethren, go out and buy all you can, because on July such and such, the rules are going to change and you can't buy it anymore. That's how serious they were at stopping these horrendous loopholes. Oh my God, Joe Biden has six mass mutual contracts. You don't think the wealthy know how this works? And if we simply emulated what they do, there's no way I'm going to set a record like what Mr. Dell has done, putting a million two hundred thousand dollars a month into life insurance. But I'll tell you what, I will take a portion of my net worth and I'm going to take it off the radar screen of the IRS for income tax purposes and use it all of my life free of income tax. That's what weekly wisdom is all about. Now, what I'd like to do is hear from any of you, if you would like to open up your mic, turn on your camera, share with me, number one, why you're here, what's prompting you to participate, and give me some feedback if you could. Um, would love to hear from you. So if you would, join us. Melissa, this is a freebie. If you want to ask another 18 questions, you can go right ahead. <laughs> You have to respond to the email I sent you first. What that? What did you say? Where did you send it to my info at the Breakaway League? Yep. Okay. I haven't seen it yet. That means our staff is not. All right. What what, what are you saying? Oh no, I just was asking which carrier you use for the. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The ten pay, and can you open the ten pay? I haven't seen. Well, you can, but it depends on who you use. Um, one of the, yeah, that we did talk about that, but I have not opened up that email yet. I haven't seen it. So I, I will give you, a, I will respond to you when we're done. Okay. Um, does the loan interest rate matter when it comes to, uh, uh, distributions in, uh, cash flow distributions? Oh, sure. Sure. But remember, this is why we use mutual insurance companies and not stock companies. Right. So we use mutual companies because if the interest rates go up, what does that do to the bottom line of the insurance company? Up, yeah. And what does that mean to our dividends? Up. Okay. In so theory, uh, in theory, it should. Yeah. So when a mutual company becomes a stock company, you didn't see that coming. Is it worth it to move that business? Um, the fear is 14 years of accumulating dividends you would lose. Well, maybe not. You 1035 it, but... When do uh, you here's what's, here's what's neat though, Melissa. The tax code changed in January of 2021 and made 7702 better. So section 7702 is what's the premise is what we use overfunded life insurance. So they actually made it better. So depending upon which company and what percentage you put in in base and what percent you use for PUAs, you can get back to the cash value that you could have lost 
had you stayed there? Really, or, and I'm not picking on that company because we know what that one is, but there's all companies. What if we're doing the same thing with a stock company? What if we're doing the same thing with IUL, VUL, E-I-E-I-E-I-O-U-L? What about the potential to go one step back to go potentially two steps forward? Sometimes well, it works and sometimes it doesn't. So it's a case by case basis. That's what I'm wondering is, it, you know, how do I figure that out? So that's kind of a monumental project right now that I need to take on. Um, but the interest rate is still the lowest in the industry with the stock new stock company, 4%. Yeah, I, I don't trust a thing they say. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now that's, again, you're talking one person's opinion. I don't believe anything coming out of that area of the country. And I you think gonna... they've earned that right to have me not believe that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you were going to mention something about why you don't like indexes. Yeah, I'm going to show you here in just a second, but I wanted to see if there's any <laughs> feedback I could get so far on what someone has heard as to why they want to stay in the weekly wisdom, because I've got an offer that I want to go over at the end of this. But first, I want to go over, oh, where is my... <laughs> I think what I did was I closed my camera. Oh, I sure did. So give me just a second while I pull this up. Um, got a quick question. Oh, good. <laughs> sorry, it's not Melissa. <laughs> I'm not sorry, Melissa. I didn't mean to inter um, Well, I'm done. <laughs> okay. So I'm uh, James Cummings. I live in Las Vegas. I've been in the business three decades. Predominantly focused on uh, annuity seminars, doing annuities some estate planning can't turn my camera on right now unfortunately but my question tom is that you know in recommending cash flow alternatives using whole life insurance um we live in such a crazy aggressive world of prosecutors and regulators how do we protect ourselves from a compliance standpoint if these guys come in and say you know you're screwing these people and you place their portfolio or a big part of their portfolio but what's your take on how what we can do to protect ourselves so we don't end up in prison or being sued by the kids of the of the clients and their attorneys. That whole picture, what, what's your take on that? That is a great question, Jim. Um, so permit me to give you my opinion. When I worked with the company out of Boston, they did a really good job of helping us prepare our files for our clients as if we were going to court because it would just be a matter of time before someone decides to sue you for blue eyes. Even though you have blue eyes, they still want to take you through that process. So yes, we are in a litigious society and they'll probably sue for everything. So I want everyone to write down these four D's as a dog, D, that if you build your, your, your folder, your file with these four things in mind all the time, you should be able to protect yourself. I also want to remind you, Jim, according to FINRA, your client is allowed to do anything they want monetarily, as long as you have had full disclosure on the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if you can prove that your recommendations were founded in good economics, there's a real good chance you're gonna win. So listen to these four Ds. The first is to discover what they have. It's called a data fact find. Kind of find out where they are. That's pretty simple. Most people discover what they have. Second, ready? Discuss it in great detail. Let's talk about why are you 100% growth and you're 67 years old? Why do you think that's a good portfolio mix? Discuss in great detail what you have. And then here's the most important, disclose. Stop hiding the fact you're gonna get paid. I believe it's only a matter of time before the government say you must carry around your tax return and show it to the people. Okay, then disclose it. I'm going to make this much if you buy from me. If you do this strategy, this is what I'm going to make. And in perpetuity, this is what I'm going to make. And then the last, number four, document. I had my clients sign my notes, Jim. I would draw a line from the lower left to the upper right. I would draw a big X and I'd say, sign these notes. Now, it's illegal as a, as a registered rep to give your notes to your client. That's called sales material. 
Now, I would sometimes jokingly say, look, I'm going to get up and go to the bathroom and I'm going to leave this paper out on the desk. So if you want to take a picture, you're stealing from me. I'm not giving you permission to do this. But when I turn my back, I don't know what you're going to do. Now, just remember, those notes, they're yours. And I would tell clients, look, here's a pencil. Here's a, here's a notepad. You can copy everything I'm writing down. Go ahead. But I can't give you my notes. So think about it. Discover, discuss, disclose, and document. Can you imagine being in deposition when you are told by their attorney, my client assumes or says, this is what you did, or this is your recommendation, and you pulled out your signed notes? Can you only imagine their attorney going, you signed those notes? What do you think your case is built on? So remember, your client can do anything they want as long as you fully disclose everything, conflict of interest, compensation. Look, don't hide behind it. Lead with it. Be proud of it. I cannot tell you how many times I've had clients say, I'm glad you're driving a nice car because if you showed up in a 1976 Toyota Celica, I'd be really concerned. Your clients want to see you prosper. It's not, it's not a war. I look at every client like this. There's financial euphoria right down the street. You don't know how to get there. I do. Let's do this journey together. I want to be the rails of a bowling alley. So when we take our grandkids, they're not rolling gutter balls, but I'm not going to pick up the ball. I know it's heavier than heck and you got to throw it. But once you make an effort, I'm going to be those rails and I'm going to keep you from committing a financial catastrophe. But Jim, I got out of the recommendation business about eight, nine years ago. I don't make recommendations anymore. Here's where you are. Here's what's going to happen to you. Do you know that on the day you retire, you could be paid seventh, seventh, six entities are going to take money before you do? Now, here's an alternative, and here's what's going to happen. You qualify for food stamps, government cheese, cell phones, Obamacare, and you're not filing a tax return. Which one do you want? And I really... Don't care which one you take. But don't misunderstand me. Everyone I talk to, I would love to have as a client if I like them. How many times have any of us on this call looked at our cell phone on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock and we look at the caller ID and we say to ourselves, oh crap, it's you. Yeah, you took them. You took them. You should have recognized through conversations, which is what Weekly Wisdom is all about, that they're not they're not buying it. You're trying to convince them to do something they don't want, don't need, or can't afford, and you're going to push this agenda on them. Oh, they're going to make your life miserable. And we all have those. I don't have those anymore because I don't sell. I let people buy. Now, I would lose that argument in a court of law. I can hear the attorney. Did you make a commission? Yes, I did. Then you sold it to him. Well, I'm required by law to get licensed and get compensation because that's the only way you can buy this product is through someone who's licensed. But my client chose to do this and here's proof. So if we if we approach this correctly, Jim, we shouldn't have a problem. But don't don't get me wrong. 47 years in the business, I have not been sued, knocking on wood. But I'm also very aware of, look, it's your money. I love I love this statement. This is a lot of money and every dime of it is yours. So I'm very protective of what you're doing. Very. If you don't see yourself winning first, I won't let you do this. I don't want a headache. I don't want a failure. I don't want a lawsuit. But what is it that you want? And why do you want it? What do you think is? The more they talk, the more they're going to tell you exactly what they want. So is that answering your question? Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Can I share something? Yes, sir. Okay. So several years ago, I had a annuity client prospect and um, sold him a couple of annuities, went through disclosures with him, had him sign the company's disclosure, my disclosures. And nine months later, they came back and their kids said that they didn't understand what they were buying. And the client said, well, he did have me initial everything on the disclosures and initial the surrender charges and the annuity policies. But Mr. Cummings didn't explain it all to me, which I did, but that's all they could remember. So finally, we reconciled the case. I didn't have to pay anything and I didn't get fined or anything. But um, my attorney told me, he said, look, from now on, 
I want you to record on your cell phone or your wherever, whatever you need to do. You record the client filling out the suitability form, record the client reading the disclosure statements, and I started doing that. And I had a client that was referred to me that won a couple million dollars in a, a bodily injury case. I wrote a pretty good chunk of annuities with Sagicor. And three months later, I got a call from the chief attorney of Sagicor and their compliance department saying, hey, your client's taking out large chunks of money out of that annuity. We're going to have to report it to the Federal Reserve as a money laundering case. And we think you inflated the suitability numbers to engage us to accept the case. And I said, well, I can prove to you that I didn't because I had followed that attorney's advice. I had the recording of the client filling out the suitability, giving me the numbers. I, I didn't make up the numbers. And that was the end of that story. Okay. So let me kind of help you with that. Yeah. Do you remember when recorded phone calls first came to be? Well, this was, I recorded oh, in person. I understand. I understand. But, but this was probably 30 years ago. Yeah. I went to our, our uh, president of our broker dealer at the time. And I said, I'm going to buy one of those. So that when they come in, all calls are recorded. And he said, never record the call. I said, why? He said, because every lawyer will take those words and turn it on you in a heartbeat. I was glad when you said, I want to record just that section that understands those compliance issues. Right. I think that's brilliant. I think that's the less you say, the better it is. So I, I think that's that's kudos to you. But the rest of the conversation, please, yeah. please reconsider. Yeah, I just I just I just recorded them filling out the application and the suitability form. Good for you. Yeah. We had a CPA in our firm here at the Breakaway League who was sued by a college for a class study. The client made money. But they said, let's pick a case and let's sue them for $9 million. And the client made money. And it and it took my friend through hell for months. He ended up doing nothing. He didn't owe any money and it was dismissed. But in the meantime, it's the interrogatories. It's, it's, it's all of the crap that you have to go through to defend yourself. So... You know, kudos to you. I I try to make life as simple as possible. And the idea of keeping it simple, stupid. I, I, I try to stay at 10,000 feet when I talk about concepts and strategies and dive in only when they want to go down to that level. Because I have found that this is why the older I get, the more analytical I'm becoming, because I see that sometimes people are sincerely interested in how does this son of a gun work? Well, I want to be prepared to be able to tell you how it works, but I'm not going to lead with how it works. And if you think about the way we sell, sit down, I'm brilliant, shut up, don't say anything. I'm going to just vomit on you all this wonderful brilliance. And then we ask at the end, after we've taken a breath, do you want to buy this? And we get blank stares. What I want to do, I, I'm probably known in our group as one of the best teasers. So I'll, I'll give you an example. If I could show you how to retire, not file a tax return, would you give me 15 minutes? And then they go, well, sure. And then I kind of say, well, excuse me, I'm going to go over and pour myself a drink or go to the restroom or go talk to a little, little, and they follow me. I had a guy in, in when I was flying um, first class, the guy asked me what I did and I, and I told him and then he said, would you show me? And I said, no. He said, you're not going to show me? I said, no, I'm not. He said, why? Well, I had just written a book, The Explanation of Services, how to answer the question, what do you do for a living? So in 20 seconds, I know if I have a prospect or if I have someone who's just wasting my time. And he said, you're not going to tell me? And I said, no, I'm not. But please, I don't mean any disrespect. I have no clients. And at that time, I didn't. My clients were other and registered reps and financial advisors, insurance agents. And he said, well, let me tell you who you're talking to. No, I'm not stupid. I listened to what he said and I go, man, you're rich. He goes, yes, I am. I said, this would be perfect for you. And he said, you're not going to show me? And I said, no, I'm not. Now, see, I didn't call Delta before that flight and say, I'm going to be sitting in 2D. Make sure someone in sitting in 2C is healthy, wants to buy life insurance, brought their checking account, and will buy life. That's not what... That see, I asked the question, how many people did you see last week? 
And us on the call will refer that question to mean, how many appointments did I have? That wasn't my question. My question was, how many people did you see? And the average American sees over 100 people a week. Unfortunately, has nothing to say to 98 of them. And if I could just give you conversation starters, so no matter where you are, what you're doing, with whom, you can create a conversation where you can become a person of interest and have someone want to hear the rest of the story. That's all I do. And I have people that have followed me to baggage claim begging for a business card. Look, I'm having fun. I'm having a lot of fun just helping people understand what they've done. I live in Nashville, and so does that radio head that says you should pay cash for everything. And if you finance anything, you're in moron, right? But if you follow that advice financially on wealth, how wealth works, it's probably some of the most misguided financial advice you could take. Most financial advice is given for people who will somewhat succeed or mostly fail. You're going to be in a lower tax bracket. No, you're not. I never in 50 years had a client on an annual review say, Tom, make sure I retire broke. Make sure I retire with 30% less income. Everyone I had wanted to make more. Okay, cool. I want you to make more too. I can't tell you how many times I sat in front of a, their CPA and he's saying they should put $235,000 into a deferred comp plan. And I'm going, his advice wants you to fail. And he's going, what are you talking about? Well, the only way to win is to deduct at a 35% tax bracket and pull out at 15. Because I don't see you ever getting poor. So if tax rates go from 35 to 55, you just made a 20% error. Oops. And guess what? You can't sue the financial advisor because taxes are taxes. And you can't talk about taxes. My broker dealer refused me to talk about taxes. The number one reason why people with money ran out. Yeah, and I finally said, what is it going to take for me to have an honest conversation about wealth? Give up your registration. Oh, I'm happy to announce that this June, it's five years of being alcoholic. I'm sorry, of being registered rep free. I can now have honest conversations about the implications of what you do every single day. And I'm not going to hide behind well, you coulda, but I didn't have to tell you. I'm writing a book right now, the right questions to ask of your financial professional, whether it's your attorney, your accountant, your advisor, and you should ask these questions and don't let them say, well, I can't talk about that. Push the agenda, get them to talk about exit strategies. I'm one of the only financial advisors I knew in my in the history of, of relationships of other financial advisors that built a practice on how do you spend efficiently what you have saved. Think about how easy that question is. Because if, you, if you're a fee-based planner, and I've convinced you that 500 million in an IRA is better than 150 million in cash value, why would I ever let you see what 150 million can do if I'm getting a fee on 500 million? And that's what's wrong, I think, with our industry. We need to have full disclosure, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Any other question? Then I want to show you this, this, this really neat idea about sequence of returns and why indexes fail most financial products. Any other question? Chris, I kind of like your picture. I don't know what that means. You are, uh, is that sort of a, like a crap-eating grin? Or you look very deceivious. He's, he's not responding. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to fire up my camera here. What I'm showing you is the S&P 500 over a 23-year period of time. We, we ran this example through April of last year. So we looked at the S&P's average rate of return versus arithmetic average rate of return. And those numbers are different. So I'm going to use the number that says compounded average annual rate of return from 2000 until April of 2023. All right, so what we've done on January 1st of 2000, if I would have put in a million dollars, I had three years of negatives. My value would have dropped down to 600. Now, if I'm accumulating money, this, this first slide I'm showing you is on the accumulation side, it does not matter when I get positives or negatives, the average is the average is the average. 
I'm going to end up with all of these positives and negatives and end up with $4,044,000. My average rate of return, 6.26% rate of return. Now, what I'm going to do is simply reverse the years that I had my poor performance. Same 6.26% return average, same exact value at the end of 22 and a half years, less than 23 years, 4,044,000, exactly the same. I, and, and indexes are allowed to be shown this way. Act, these are average, and we're going to get you the average. So if I've earned 6.26% as an average rate of return, I'm going to show you, if I put in a million dollars, And now I'm going to pull out $60,000 a year because that's my average rate of return. I should be able to do that. I've got three years of negatives. I've dropped to a value as low as 400. Oh, come on. Why is it doing that? Come on. Wow. No, don't go away on me now. Don't, don't, don't. Oh, unbelievable. Really? Oh, it went the other way. My mistake. Okay. Woo, woo. All right. I'm going to pause for a little bit so we can get our recording under control. I've got those first three of negative years and I'm down to $498,000. Beginning balance at the end of the third year, I have half of my money. Now, I'm getting the same exact rate of return that I was. And look, I run out of money in the 17th year. I have nothing. Now, the other side of this coin, I'm going to show you. I'm the exact same index, exact same distribution, exact same deposit, exact same 23 years. And all I've done is reverse the years that I get the negative numbers. They're down here. I started with a million and I pulled out all of these payments. I end up with $1,598,000. How can an average give you bankrupt in year 17, 60% growth after distributions at the end of 23? The average is the average is the index is the index. This is why I say the month and year you decide to retire and the city and state you live in on the day you retire could have more of an impact on your quality of your life than the investment that you're in. Because the S&P, I've heard people say, well, the S&P has averaged 20% a year over the last 30 years. The numbers that are thrown around in our industry are truly pathetic. This is actual. This shows running out of money, same assumption, but just reversing the year that I retire and up 60%. The day you retire will have more of an impact on the quality of your retirement than the index you bought. Now, have fun with that one. Try and get that through compliance. That should be a chore and a half. But that's the problem with our industry. We're allowed to show average, and then we're allowed to illustrate average. What would have happened had you retired in February of 2020. And this is before COVID was announced. That was your first date of retirement and you got your first check. March, the Dow dropped 26%. Yep. You would have had to surrender about 150% more shares in March to come up with the same cash that you got 30 days before that. Why? Because you just happened to be in the wrong thing at the wrong time. If I was on the accumulation side, COVID meant nothing to me. The stock market ride meant nothing to me. It's the value of actual versus the value of average. And if we don't know the difference in our industry, what is the difference between those two numbers? Then we need to make sure our E&O is current and we've got a strong legal team because clients need to know what they're getting. Any questions?
Let me look at the chat window here. There's probably been some questions. Uh, thank you, Jim. Tom, you know, the regular is press user. Grace, I'm going to tag us even where I'm going to let yourself turn to the quick. Um, I was walking, Jim, with the uh, chief investment officer for one of the largest life insurance companies in, in Ireland last year. And I said, you know, I, I, I show, um, we, we have three good relationships with three different mutual insurance companies, and I'm showing the worst performance of all three, and I'm selling the crap out of it. And Melissa, this goes to your point. You know, we had for years one of the best illustrated contracts, and all of a sudden they said, you know what, we don't longer want to be in the life insurance business, and we're just going to empty the space. I don't want to go through that again ever, ever. And I'm not going to ever sell again the number one this year, because to be the number one this year and next year is almost impossible. But I will, and I've never lost a client showing a good product. I've lost clients when the product is crap or I choose not to service them. But as long as it was good, I never lost any clients. And define good, by the way. If you can get that in writing, Jim, and have that disclosed on your forms, I think that would help too. Have them share with you what they want out of life and what they're trying to accomplish. And you'll find that a lot of the things that they're doing don't literally jive with what they're saying. I'll give you a quick example. The, the Weekly Wisdom uh, review we just recently closed was the three questions I start off with every interview. And it's three questions that I ask to sort of get people to understand where their head is financially. And then I'm going to show them that what they're doing is the exact opposite of what they just told me. Question number one, do you want to make more money every year? Question number two, do you want to remain successful on the day that you retire or are you looking forward to a pay cut? And number three, do you think personal income tax rates have to go up over your lifetime? And if they answer yes, 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 then I just remind them Then today you're in the lowest tax bracket of forever. Not today, forever. Why are you deducting anything? So again, of these, these weekly wisdoms that I'm trying to do is I just want you to think. I want you to ask yourself, what if? You talk about how to become attractive, how to be interesting, how to be a person of interest. Stop sounding like everybody else. Start picking a lane, own it, and start sharing with people why you believe it's the best thing in the world. And as a result of that, you'll find people that are attracted to your passion or will look at you and go, you're a flaming ding -dack. Go away. Either way, I win. My job is not to go out and find people who need to buy life insurance. My job is to go out and find people who believe as I do. The problem in our industry is very few of us have a firm belief in anything other than everything is really good. All the products we offer, they're really good. They, they perform really, really good. Why don't you pick one? Know everything there is to know about it. Own that space. Be known in the industry as that's the person I need to speak with when I'm in reference to anything that is remotely close to what it is that I do. I own the space that I'm in. I don't want to sell other stuff. Yeah, they're out there. I was, I was interviewed by one of the presidents of the companies we work with. And he says, you know, Tom, we sell other products. And I said, with all due respect, I don't care. I don't care. I know you do. You need profit from all the profit centers. I don't care. And I, that, I, I don't mean that disrespectfully. I'm just saying I'm focused. The older I get, the more focused I am. Why? Because I'm getting good at this. If I have to know a little bit about a lot, I'm never really 100% on, on any of those ideas. I have a little space of the financial pie on how wealth works, and I basically own that space. I love that idea. I'm hoping through these weekly wisdom deals, you guys are going to feel the same way. Any other questions? Tom, what do you call that thing that you use when you show your illustrations you can see your hand what do you call that a miracle a miracle <laughs> it's called what do you, what it's, do you buy miracles <laughs> it's called an ipivo camera go on ebay and there are 75 bucks 100 bucks if you're going to buy a new one they're really really good there's a couple hundred this i bought on ebay i think for 50 bucks how do you spell that i v i p e v 
O I P V O. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right. If there are no more questions, let me finish with my slideshow here. Anything else anyone want to ask? Let me ask you guys a question. Was this a valuable meeting? Can you just lighten up your can you lighten up your chat window? If you don't want to turn your camera on or respond verbally, can you lighten up the chat window and tell me was this a good meeting? Yes. Very good meeting. All right. I think everybody else is asleep. Oh, nope, there they are. They're chatting away. All right, all right, all right, all right. Look at all the thumbs up. Way to go, Dan. Since you've never heard any of this before, this has got to be this has got to be new business, right? All right. So tell me if this works. Can you see this? Can you see that? I'm going to read this to you because this is well thought out words we're going to put in order so that I can make my point. Would it be okay if I showed you how I can help you even more than I have today? If you thought today was good, what would this be if we were to continue this? You can do this all by yourself. I've just shown you how. You can have relevant conversations about ideas that are going to be in the weekly wisdom, and I hopefully will lead to much more business. The problem is life gets in the way, family matters get in the way, time gets in the way, or maybe you just need more accountability and support. What if you could work with me on a more close basis? Better yet, what if I could have an opportunity to speak with you on a weekly basis? Well, you can. The Weekly Wisdom Live Training Course. This is what we're talking about right now, an opportunity on a weekly basis. It's the only way I know where you can get the answers and results you really need and don't you want them when you think about it if if you read something that is in one of those weekly wisdoms and you're going how do you you use it well if you don't subscribe to this you're never going to get a hold of me and we're never going to know so is there an alternative to that yes this program is limited since there's only so many questions i can answer in an hour and this is each week it's wednesday at four o'clock eastern depending upon where you're in the country four o'clock eastern every single wednesday would you pay a thousand bucks to make an additional 10 grand? If I could help you understand simply one of the ideas that you have found in any of the weekly wisdoms that I have posted, and you want more information about how to use it, what to expect from it, what would your angle be? What are you looking for? And you could make an extra 10 grand. Would you pay a thousand bucks to do that? But at that price, I'm not going to be able to hit everybody. And I'm making myself excluded rather than included. Here you go. That's the price. Four bucks, 97 cents a month. It's a dollar 16 a week. You will be invited on a weekly basis to the weekly wisdom. You have an option to, to respond to what was just recently posted or any of the weekly wisdoms that we have in our, um, in our website. This is what the website would look like when you go. You sign up on the lower right give us your information and we will charge you a whopping $4.97 a month. But that's only the start because this is really what I'm trying to do. This this, this um, vocal that you can see, um, not vocal, the image that you see behind me is really all about the Professionals Forum at the Country Music Auditorium. And if you've never been to Nashville, it's basically the, the, the auditorium is built as if it were the inside of a whiskey barrel. So the stage comes out in the middle. There's floors and seating all around. March, or excuse me, February 28th, 29th, and March 1st, Nashville, we are going to have some of the best speakers in the country joining me about conversation starters. How do we become a person of interest? And it's not going to be, this isn't an event that you have to join. It's not like the MDRT event. It's not like a company event. You have to sign up to be a New York Life agent to be able to attend. All you have to do is show up. You're going to rub shoulders with for 10 hours. We have 10 hours on our two and a half days where you're going to be able to speak one-on-one -on -one with the following speakers. And I hope I get everybody on here. And Jim, maybe next time we do this, we have a list of all the speakers that are on here too. I'm going to go through um, that we had on the board. Van Miller, 
Van is now sharing with me some of the questions that he, the new questions that he's coming up with, and they're they're absolutely mind boggling. They're thought provoking questions that should get people to stop in their tracks. Jim Root is going to be coming back now. Jim is Van Miller's coach. Jim is speaking around the world right now. He he does the um, a, an event like this for Canada. It's called the Canada Sales Congress, and I've been fortunate to speak at that event. And this is the United States equivalent. There isn't a place we're gonna be able to go in the United States and get this kind of information. We've got Arwen Becker who has built her career on selling to women. Mm -hmm. Women own the majority of the wealth in this country. Women live longer than men. And when you're dead, when you're a billionaire, it goes to someone. It's gonna be normally the spouse. We've got Wendy Feldman. Yes, that's Ben Feldman's granddaughter. She's a 35-year veteran with New York Life. She's going to talk about what she does. With a name like that in the industry, how does she handle uh, what the daily grind is that she goes through? David Kinder is going to be on. David, as you may know, has interviewed more into influential speakers around the world than any of us. And he's going to be talking about what he has learned and some snippets of ideas from some of the best speakers in the world. Turner Thompson is going to be here. Now, Turner is 85 years old. He golfs every day he can. He golfs 36 holes a day, and he always walks on the golf course as a single, wanting to play golf with a foursome. And the, his charisma, when he walks into a room, you're just your eyes are like magnets. You're just drawn to this guy. And the words that come out of his mouth are just fascinating. He can make you feel like a million dollars in a matter of just a few minutes. I've got Sandy Chassel coming in. Sandy is going to be uh, was one of the industry's um, most successful coaches, training top of the table people and those at court and regular MDRT who aspire to want to be at the top of the table. And then to finish it all up, we've got George Segerson. If you don't know who George is, he's a 50 year uh, lifetime member of the Million Dollar Roundtable. The majority of those years at top of the table, he's been in the business a long time. Here's the interesting slant of why he's gonna be here. His average age of his new clients are less than 30. So he's going to talk about how to take generational wealth and have conversations with the younger generation. Look, it's an opportunity for all of us to rub shoulders with some of the most successful people in the country, around the world. And we're going to have 10 hours that we're going to do that. If you go to the professionalsforum.com and register, we've got three different ticket levels. Ultra VIP is being picked up in the airport in a chauffeur driven automobile. We will pay for one night of your three nights of stay. Tuesday night is a hockey game. We, we will have special seats for us at the hockey game. The Predators are playing, I think it's Winnipeg. I don't know. Uh, I used to be a, a uh, season ticket holder for the Predators, but I, I gave up on that after or just before COVID. So this is, this is why I wanna give back. This is my personal expense to do this. This costs, a lot of money to put on, a lot of money to put on. And I want to give back. Kitty Corner from the Country Music Auditorium, Country Music Hall of Fame is Bridgestone Arena. Bridgestone Arena holds 18,000 people. My goal before I die is to fill Bridgestone Arena with like-minded people who want to make the insurance industry a positive career choice because unfortunately, our industry only has an 8% success rate and has accepted a 92% failure rate. My mission is to make that at least 16% success rate. Still, that's a horrible rate for people who quit. Well, through these weekly wisdoms, we're going to give you an opportunity to see why the Breakaway League writes five to $10 million of premium a year through conversations where we create attitudes where people want to buy as much life insurance as they can because they see the benefit of buying it for themselves. Any other questions? Question. I got a question. Yes, sir. To go to this conference, I personally am a lousy note taker. So, how do I go to this and retain enough of the information that when I get back home and I start, you know, reviewing it, that I can implement topics and concepts and subjects from this meeting? Conference? Well, Jim, if you think about the way we used to do it, we would go to a convention, we we're given a little notebook and the speaker speaks for 45 minutes and then another speaker comes for 45 minutes and then another speaker. You can't remember crap from anything. 
Exactly. That's what We're going to have 10 hours. We have breaks where they're an hour between breaks. We're going to have speaker stations where the speakers are going to go stand in front of their special emblem and be available to talk to everyone. As, as When I was growing up, Ben Feldman's and John Savage's of the world, I could never meet. And even today, you can go see Van Miller on social media, but by God, to be able to rub shoulders and talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, what would you do here? You will remember that, Jim. Okay. I promise you. You may not remember everything, but you're going to remember enough. You only need one idea, one question from the nine speakers or eight speakers that we have and make thousands and thousands of dollars in revenue. Okay. That's why. That's why I'm doing this. And I strongly encourage you to bring a recording device. Oh, and we're going to video the whole event. Well, Jim, thank you, sir. How's that, Mr. Cummings? We're, we took care well, of you. Captain Love, I would say that that's um, more than adequate. <laughs> well, I accept that... Um, Beautiful title. My dad was a Marine. I answered the phone. Major Love Residence. Tom speaking. How may I help you? Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> but Tom Love has to sign my notes. <laughs> Steve, I, I have a book. I'm going to have several books there. I'd be glad to sign them for you. I think that. Thank you. Thank you. Here, do me a favor, since we are recording this, and, and I know if you don't want to be on the recording, but could you do me a favor? Could you type in the chat window? If you don't want to contribute with image, can you chat what this meeting or what this, this video conference right now has meant to you? Because there's a lot of people on this call I have not met before, and I'm excited about that. Confidence. Ooh, there you go. Awesome. 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 I'm going to shut the recording off. Um, Mr. Graham, is there anything else we needed? Oh, yes, there is. Yes, yes, yes. I have started a, um, I like that, Chris, way to go. I've started a new Facebook group called For the Love of Whole Life. Yes, pun intended. When I was in school, um, Love was a horrible name. I was kidded a lot, but now it sort of helps. For the love of whole life. And what I want to try to do is I want to, through that website, give you stories, concepts where we can collaborate. And I want to interview other people around the world that use life insurance, permanent life insurance, in ways that are different than mine. So that we can have a community of people who do like the idea of permanent insurance and are looking for ways to promote it. It's free. I'd love to have you join um, for the love of whole life insurance. Anything else? You guys are going to get a thank you email for attending. Make sure you uh, sign up for everything we do. Um, look forward to having you in Nashville. Tom, one other question, if I may. Yes, please. Aside from this conference and aside from these weekly wisdom shows we can get on Wednesdays, can you tell me a little bit about joining your the Tom Love explanation of benefits program? That because I don't I, I really don't understand it. I don't know really what it is. Sure. What it sure. What's involved? I have a a um, training course online available. Um, it's three hundred ninety seven bucks. You'll you'll get a workbook, and it will tell you how to create an explanation of services. And I'll, I'll go ahead and give you mine. Now it took me six months to develop this, so I don't expect miracles this is a work in progress so i'll go ahead and give you mine when someone says to me what do you do for a living this is this is how i answer i've never had more fun in my life doing what i'm doing right now helping the average american taxpayer understand how wealth fees and taxes work on average we're finding between 50 and 70 thousand dollars a year per household in wealth that is slipping through your hands because nobody understands wealth and income taxes and fees and interest now, if I sat down with you for just 10 minutes 
10 minutes and I identified $10,000 that you had no idea you were losing, would you want it back? Absolutely. So I get, there's my appointment. And here's the beauty of this, Jim. When you when you do master this, I don't say that to everybody. The reason, I may not like you. See, we feel we have to go out and sell everything to everybody if they can fog a mirror. That was my dad's favorite quote. Son, if they can fog a mirror, they can buy life insurance. Well, with all due respect, dad, if they can fog a mirror and believe what I believe, they could become a wonderful client. But just because they can afford what it is that I'm selling, I may not want them. So what you will learn when you take that course, the EOS, you'll learn to be the buyer in the relationship. Good I'm point. not selling crap. I'm figuring out if I like you. And if I don't like you, what do you do? I'm a proctologist. <laughs> okay. Good questions, Jim. For all you other people who's, who remain silent, I'm going to shut the camera off or not the camera, I'm gonna stop the recording.